My brother Stephen and I were sitting on my back porch, drinking as we often did on the weekends. The more we drank, the more stupid we became. Tonight was no different. What we didn't know was that this night was going to change our lives forever. Stephen was a year younger than I, grew an inch taller and a few inches wider, held out his phone. He had been watching YouTube videos about people exploring abandoned places. He had one queued up for me to watch. Take a look at this one, bitch, he said as he stood up. I need another beer, want one? Nah, I'm good, I said, putting on my readers to watch this video on a tiny phone. Ever since we were little kids, we watched horror movies with our mother. Our mother was a huge horror fan. Horror, it seems, was built into our DNA. My name is Wayne. I'm a six-foot string bean with a marshmallow six-pack around the gut, all beer and no muscle. We were raised on horror and chicken, and as you will undoubtedly come to realize, yes, we are half chicken. The first horror movie that I remember ever watching was Salem's Lot. That movie scared me so badly. I had bruises around my neck from holding the blankets tight around it. Our childhood was beautiful, and we often sit here on the weekends, bringing everything back, reliving it over and over again as we drink away the future. Now, we were both middle-aged, and our mother sadly passed away a little less than a year ago. It wasn't long after she passed that my brother and I were talking about doing something to sort of honor her memory and put the fear back into us. Sadly, these days, horror feels more like comedy to us, while real life seems like a horror movie. We wanted to do something that would put the jolt back into our hearts, raise the hairs on our skin like it had when we were kids, sitting around the TV with our mother. This tale I'm going to tell you now is our first of many adventures into the paranormal. It was a clear night, and we were at my house drinking. Stephen had just gotten back with another beer. I handed back his phone. That was a creepy place, I told him. Yeah, we ought to do things like that, he said, but we just have to do it. If all we do is sit here and talk about it, then that's all we'll ever do. He was right. We often did talk about it, but it never went anywhere. It made me think, and smoking a little weed made me ponder. I remember as a child, I always wanted to be a writer like Stephen King. But the stories never got wrote. How can I be a writer if I don't write? How can we fulfill our dreams if we don't pursue them? Four beers and a little weed later, I learned how to live that night. Let's do it. Let's do it right now, I said, standing up, throwing the beer can down in a show of anger. Why? I don't know, but Stephen laughed and stood up too, also throwing his beer down. His arms stiffened into a muscular pose, then reached into the cooler to grab another beer. Let's do this, bitch. There's a cemetery just down the road, I said. Should be an easy first step. Let's go, he said, grabbing the cooler. Our brave souls had the liquid courage to hop into my golf cart that rattled and bobbed along the roadside and drive down to the old Baptist church about a mile from my house. The church was built in the 1920s, and it was a common construction for that time. If you can picture the little house on the prairie church, or even a look to a more modern TV show, The Walking Dead, then you have a clear picture of what this church looks like. It was still an active church as well. What was particularly exciting about this church was that it had a small cemetery in the back. Most, if not all, the gravestones were dated between the 1920s through the 1940s. The founding pastor's grave marker showed that he died just three months after completing the church. We weren't sure what to expect at the cemetery, but we were damn sure going to honor our mother's memory that night. Both of us really were more than likely to run at the faintest sound, so each of us made wages on who would be running scared first. We took a few more beers and stashed them in the cooler, then grabbed our phones and headed out along the side of the road. Stephen drove the cart, and I swear we hit every bump or divot along the way. 
We drank another beer on the ride over and boasted how neither of us spilled a drop along the bumpy trail. Damn, boy, I said, almost chipping a tooth. Slow down. I can't, he said. The faster I drive, the less time I have to think that I'm doing something really stupid right now. Well, faster then, I yelled, holding my beer up high. Here's to being stupid, then adding a yee-haw at the end, which Stephen returned with one of his own. There was nothing but smiles and pure joy on our faces. We were heading into our future. Normally thinking about the future brought on depression, but not tonight. Our future looked as bright as the night looked dark. Once we got close to the church, we left the cart just off church property. We didn't need any strobing lights pulling up and ruining our fun. You ready to do this, bitch? I asked, taking the last gulp of my beer and putting the can back in the cooler. Let's go, Pinocchio, Stephen said, tossing the empty can into the cooler and grabbing another. Pinocchio was a nickname he gave me when we were kids. It was not because I was a habitual liar or anything, but really because I had a rather large nose. When we were kids, those were fighting words. We would fight until either of us got too tired, or one of us would start laughing at the funny-looking faces we made pulling each other's hair. Yes, we pulled each other's hair. We were strange like that. Now, the word is more of a term of endearment and ushers in the fond memories of our childhood. There we were, stumbling and swaying our way to the back of the church, towards the graveyard. The forest surrounded the cemetery, and the trees were also swaying gently. The crickets were chirping. Stephen was the first to pull out his camera. It's recording, he said, pointing the phone towards me. Give us an introduction. Hello, everybody. We're going to look for ghosts in the cemetery, I said, shrugging my shoulders, not really knowing what to say. That was lame, he said. Here, hold the camera. I took the camera from him and aimed it while my middle finger scratched my nose. He didn't catch it. Here we are, America. Tonight, Wayne and I are in one of the most haunted graveyards in all America. Join us as we explore and witness the horrific events together. I turned the camera down. What the hell, I said. I was actually really impressed, to be honest. It was a huge exaggeration but who would really watch it knowing there was nothing of interest here? That's how you do it, he said. I may have to start calling you Pinocchio, I said, putting a curled finger to my nose, then pointing out with it, suggesting a growing nose. That's what they do on them shows, though, to get views. Do you think in every video they get something? We may even have to fake it, too, he said, taking his phone back. Watch this, he spun around and with an inward sigh he said, Oh my God, did you all hear that? Something in this area right here whispered something. It sounded like it said, Get out. I hope I got it on camera. We'll have to play it back later to see what it said. Wow, I said, slowly clapping my hands. We haven't even done one video yet and already were lying, but he was right, and I knew it. For the views, I said, holding up my phone. For the views, he repeated, holding up his beer can. I turned on my camera. We both did. Oh, look, I said, pointing at a grave marker. Edward Jones died February 14th, 1921, age 56. Don't want to keep up with the Joneses right now, do you? He said. I shook my head that I didn't, but it reminded me of something. You know, I said, if I remember correctly, I read a story about this guy. This guy murdered his entire family and then shot himself. My brother looked at me with amazement. Really? I answered, for the views, and we both laughed. The graveyard was surrounded by woods on three sides, and we had a slither of moonlight. Back towards the rear of the cemetery, we heard an owl hoot. We both looked at each other. That was freaky, Stephen said, his eyes a little wider, his mouth drawn into an oval. You act like you never heard an owl before, I copied his expression. 
Not in a cemetery, bitch. I agreed and shrugged my shoulders. Yeah, I guess it is a little spooky in a cemetery. Stephen crunched up his beer can. I need another beer. Do you want one? Sure, I said. Stephen began walking away. I watched him wobble. I would be surprised if he lasted through the night. He's probably had a few too many already, but this was our first ghost hunt, and I'm sure more beer will do us both good. Now, here I am, alone in the cemetery. It was spooky, even if there was nothing to be scared of. The mind interprets things differently at night like how it sees the shadows cast by the moonlight. I never liked being in a cemetery even during the daylight. Now here we are, standing in one at night. I panned my phone over to Mrs. Jones. She died the same day and year at forty-six. Ten years younger, I thought. I thought it was strange that she died the same day. Maybe she was murdered after all, I thought again. Goosebumps formed on my arms, I began walking around the gravestones, getting good video of every stone. I began to smell smoke, but I didn't see smoke anywhere. It was faint, but distinct. I looked up and saw the moon. It was peeking through the trees. Something flew right in front of me, flying through the light of my flashlight. I drew back, hoping it was just a bat. I'll have to re-watch the video to confirm. I was sensing something was not right, but I didn't understand it, and I wasn't sure if it was just my imagination. After clearing the third row of gravestones, I realized how quiet it had become. The crickets stopped chirping, and the owls stopped hooting, and my mind began churning. I was thinking about the old zombie movies, the dead reaching up through the ground, coming up and out of their graves. I shivered and stepped back away from a grave I was sure I was standing on. And as I was thinking that, I thought I heard something a few graves over. I'm sure it was nothing, but I went to the gravestone, where I thought I had heard it. I shivered, and chills rushed through my body, and the hairs on my arm stood straight up. The stone read, Thomas Jones, died February 14th, 1921 at the age of six. I was only making up the story. Now, I didn't know. Searching the internet gave me the answer I needed, but now regret wanting. The Joneses died in a house fire. No one survived. Reading on, there were rumors that their neighbor locked them in and set the fire. The man who was rumored to have done it was named Charles Daly. He was reported to have caused several of the local residents to move away. In 1931, he was found hung where the Jones house once stood. I did smell smoke, I said, turning the camera to face me. I'm sure of it. Let me see if Charles Daly is here, I said, and began to walk around, rechecking the graves. I didn't see his name after scanning each grave with the camera. He was not here. I thought it was weird. Then I wondered where the Joneses and Daly's house had been. Could I be living on the property where either one of them had lived? I didn't think so, but I also didn't think I would ever know for sure. Unless there are records of it in town. Stephen should have been back by now, I said after turning the camera back to me. What's taking him so long? Did he get murdered by a demon or ghost? I added, half-joking. After thinking about what I said, I began to get chills on top of chills. I lowered the camera, although it was still recording. It was taking Stephen a long time. I decided it was best I go find out what was taking him so long. I began walking back towards the golf cart. It was still some distance away, and the golf cart was well out of sight. As I walked, I heard something rustle in the woods to my right. I stopped and pointed my camera in that direction. My eyes were wide, scanning the area intently. "'Bitch, are you in there?' I said. "'If you're trying to scare me, it's not working.' Under my breath, I admitted that it was, my camera still panning the woods. Then my heart sank. 
I realized he would never have gone into the woods to do a prank like this. He would have gotten scared just waiting for me to walk by. I know my brother all too well. I did the next thing that people tend to do in a situation like this. I said hello, then raising the camera to video a selfie. I've been watching too many ghost videos, I said, and focused the camera back into the woods. I began to walk again, slower, my mind and ears studying, imaginating as I went. A branch snapped another few feet in the woods, something I thought was following me. I stopped, my heart racing. Images of vampires and zombies rushed through my head. I lifted the camera again, scanning the wooded area. I couldn't see anything. My ears were like radars, focused. I swallowed hard and quickened my pace. The golf cart was just beginning to come into view. Stephen wasn't there. I did a complete circle right there, looking for him, the camera following. I looked into the cooler and two beers were no longer there. He took the beers, I thought, but he never returned. I could feel the blood rush to my face. The goosebumps I had earlier returned even more intense. There was no way he could have passed me. I thought I'd better go back and check the cemetery just to be sure. The woods going back was on my left this time. I kept my eye out for whatever might rush out at me. My imagination was going crazy. I would kill him if he was playing a joke. But then I would also be relieved because it didn't look good right now. The fear I felt was real. Upon reaching the cemetery, I checked behind every gravestone, whispering his name. My hands were visibly shaking. I looked down at my watch, and it was 02.30 in the morning. Thoughts of demons, monsters, and murderers littered my mind. I was checking behind another gravestone when I heard something. I should clarify, I heard someone, somewhere behind me. It was definitely a voice. I shone my camera in that direction. Stephen, I whispered. The wind began to pick up. The trees swayed, their leaves fluttered. It felt like the forest was coming alive. I listened, my ears straining to catch the sound again, the hairs raised on my arms and neck, my body shivered. It felt like, or at least I sensed, someone or something was watching me. It was the strangest feeling. I've felt that in the past, and I'm sure most of you have too. You look up and someone is staring at you, then they look away. I was feeling that right now, except I didn't know where to look. I saw something from the corner of my eye. I spun around to get a good look, pointing with the camera. My thoughts at once envisioned vampires, but there was nothing there. I could hear my own breathing now. My legs were beginning to feel rubbery. I got to stop imagining things, I whispered to myself. From behind me, back in the woods, I heard that voice again. It was a low grunt. I spun around to look. By this time, the beers I ingested earlier needed a quick exit. I had to pee. Bad. That is what happens in middle age. It comes on all of a sudden. I tittered on both my feet, trying to control it. But there was no controlling it. I whipped it out and pissed on Mr. Jones. I reread his gravestone as I released myself. Edward Jones died February 14th, 1921 at the age of 56. I know that must be some sort of crime, or at the very least a bad omen to piss on someone's grave, and I would be guilty. I had done it, not wanting to, but having to. I'm sorry, Mr. Jones, I said as I tapped out and zipped up. I turned to observe my surroundings when I heard the grunting sound again. It sounded muffled. I tapped on my windpipe, hoping to loosen the chokehold on my breath. I didn't need to see my pant leg shaking to know I was scared. Every muscle in my body was tensed. Slowly I moved closer to the edge of the woods where I thought the sound might be coming from. Something groaned about fifteen to twenty feet in the woods, although it was definitely muffled. I thought it sounded like Stephen, but I wasn't completely sure. I took a few steps into the woods. My light glimpsed a shiny object just ahead. It was a beer can. I moved closer and picked it up. 
It was still cold, opened, a puddle had formed where it laid, the beer had seeped out and foamed. My ears pricked, my eyes became sharp, I felt like I was in the zone. I was scared as hell, but I was in the zone. There was no noise, no chirping, no breaking branches, but at that moment I could have heard a pin drop. I'm sure of it. I crept deeper into the woods, my light quivering, guiding my path. Just ahead, I saw another beer can. The hairs on the back of my neck stood on end. I reached down and picked up the unopened beer. I held it. It was also cold, then tossed it to my left. Another low, dull groan came a few feet in front of me. I nearly jumped out of my skin and almost ran. The imagination is a very powerful thing, as the worst fears rose like a tidal wave in my mind. Another stifled groan. This time I heard the words, although softly, Help! It had to be Stephen, and although it was muffled, it definitely was his voice. I rushed over, snapping a twig as I knelt down beside him, my pants becoming wet. He was trying to say something, but it was mumbled. I also began to smell something foul. It was almost like he was laughing while trying to say something. His head turned a little. Clumps of dirt clung to his face and mouth. Help me, bitch he slurred, becoming agitated. He added something else, and this is where I thought he was laughing. You're in my puke. I jumped up and seeing bile on my knee, I dry heaved several times before releasing my own bile. You asshole, I said through fits of heaves, spitting the taste out of my mouth. I could hear a chuckle as he repeated, help me, bitch. Hold on, I said, taking several leaves and brushing off his vomit, still dry heaving as I did so. Stepping around the vomit, I leaned back down and turned him over and sat him up. I noticed he peed his pants. It was my turn to laugh now. His dirt-soaked face looked at his feet. His foot had been entangled in a vine. He stared at me blankly. I saw his mouth tighten, but then expand as his insides lurched forward. He turned to his side, and the dam burst open, and he flooded the ground with hot dogs and beer. After his stomach had settled, I picked him up, being careful not to touch anything liquidy on him. I guided him from behind, holding on to the back of his shirt. He wobbled and nearly fell several times before we reached the golf cart. I drove us home, stopping on occasion so he could heave some more. I'm sure the bumps and divots I had to drive through didn't help him any. By 11 a.m. we were both beginning to wake. He still had dirt on much of his face, but he did feel better, despite having a headache. He told me what happened the night before. He was on his way back with the beer when he had the sudden urge to pee. He said he dropped his beer first, then knew he couldn't unbuckle his pants without having to drop the other beer. As he rounded the tree, his foot got entangled in the vine, and he hit the ground face first. He said he couldn't remember much after that. I couldn't resist. I took a picture of him. The dirt still clung to his face. One of these days, if you ever see me, ask me to show you the picture. I keep it on my phone, and whenever he calls, it's that picture that pops up. I laugh every time. I did check the county records a few days later, and although the address wasn't the same as what I have, the plot of land where I live was owned by Charles Daly. The house was torn down a few years later, and the house I currently live in was built in its place. I shivered at the thought, and I would have to investigate further. I wanted to know where he was buried. I wanted to know more details, and if the story I saw on the internet was more than just a rumor, I had to find out.